ora koto, akala fa atu, kolem krakenaho. I'm in with the Alexander Turnbull Library's Outreach Services team, and it's my real pleasure to welcome you all here to our very first Connecting to Collections online. Connecting to Collections is usually held on site monthly. At each presentation, specialist librarians and archivists explore some of the wonderful collections held in the Turnbull and National Libraries and in Archives New Zealand and tell you how they can be accessed and you can use them. We've also had presentations from our colleagues at Ngā Sound and Vision. COVID restrictions mean an on-site event isn't possible this month, but it seems particularly appropriate that we can use this time for an introduction to two of fabulous websites supported by the National Library, Digital New Zealand and Digital Pacific. A little housekeeping before we get underway. As you'll have seen when you join the webinar, we're recording it. And as this is a webinar, your videos and microphones are turned off. We're also on Facebook Live. However, there's still an opportunity to interact with those of us in the room, actually we're in several rooms, and with others in the audience. If you'd like to share where you're at, um, joining us from, um, have any general questions or comments, then please add those to the chat. If you have questions for Tim and Kelly, then add those to Q&A. You'll find both buttons at the bottom of your Zoom screen. At the end of the pre presentation, um, we'll be monitoring the chat and the questions and answers. I'll come back um, to ask our questions to the panelists. I am now delighted to introduce Kelly Dix, engagement, online engagement manager with Digital New Zealand, and Tim Kong, program manager for virtual, uh, Pacific Virtual Museum pilot. And they will explore some of the features on sites that enable people to engage with the content. We're really looking forward to your presentations. Over to you. Uh, tēnā koutou katoa. My name is Kelly Dix and I am the Online Engagement Manager at the National Library. My role is to help connect people with heritage collections and tāunga through Digital NZ, the National Library website and Papers Past. If you have any questions, yes, use the chat or you can email us info at digitalnz.org. Right, I'll just share my screen. And we'll get started. So Digital NZ is a search service coordinated by the National Library, and it aims to make digital content easier to find, share, and use. This includes helping people to um, find, share, and use digital content from museums, libraries, government departments, publicly funded organizations, the private sector, and community groups. On Digital NZ, you can search across the digital collections of more than 200 organizations to find artworks, archives, newspapers, all sorts of items. The magic of Digital NZ is that you can go to one website for these collections. You don't have to go to lots of different sites to find the material. It's a perfect place to start your research. An important point to note is that Digital NZ is not a repository. We don't hold items, but instead we point people out to digital collections around the country. We do this by bringing together metadata, the information about the items, such as date, place, name, keywords, etc. You can see that this search for coat brings up content from Te Awamutu Museum, the New Zealand Fashion Museum, and Auckland War Memorial Museum. People might ask why they wouldn't just use Google to find this information. Google is great for finding out all sorts of things, but Digital NZ surfaces some collection items that are harder to find. It also includes a trustworthy link back to the source of the content. You can see that this photo comes from Auckland Library's Heritage Images collection. If you click on it, you can find more information such as the photographer, which was the New Zealand Herald, the date it was taken, the 7th of February, 1950, and also information about credit or reuse of this photo. But this session's about 
telling stories. And one of the wonderful things about DNZ is the stories tool. You can create or curate your own story using items from more than 200 content partners. You can use images, audio, video, research papers, newspapers, and more. There's more than 7,000 stories already on Digital NZ. They range from St. Luke's, the mall in Auckland, through to the suburb, the Lower Hutt suburb, Nainai. There's so many more stories that haven't been told, so you can use Digital NZ to tell your own story. To do this, you sign up in the top right-hand corner. There's a button. And you enter your name, your username, an email address, and a password. You can click the link to confirm your, in your email to confirm your account. And then you're in. So I'm just going to switch to the live site now. And we'll take a closer look at how to make a story. So to view your stories, you can come over here to my stories. And I've created one already called Lawn Bowls. So to add an image to your Lawn Bowl story, click on Explore. Search for Lawn Bowls. And then you can see there's 16,000 items with the metadata Lawn Bowls applied. Almost a third of them are images, but there's also audio and video. The reason that there's no stories yet is because mine is, isn't published, it's not public. So to add a story, add an image to a story, you click on the add to stories and then select the lawn bowl story. You can also, if you're doing um, quite a few images at a time, you can click to always add to the story. So if we go back and look at my story, you can see that the image I added is sitting at the end. So when you create a story, you add the title, you can add a story description, and you can add some subjects that help it turn up better in, in searches. You can also upload your own image. So this is an image that might belong to you. So you've taken it or um, someone else you know may have taken it. So to do this, you browse for the image. You search for it and open it. Now this is a photo of my grandpa, Les, playing bowls. So I'm gonna call the title Les. That's the description. Now, one of the things we need to consider when we upload an image is the copyright. So there's three options for copyright. You can attribute it as Creative Commons, which means that anyone can be used, can use the image as long as they credit the copyright holder. It has no known copyright, or else you can add all rights reserved. If you're not quite sure what copyright to use, this really good flow chart will help you uh, figure out, you know, what kind of copyright could apply to it. I happen to know that my grandmother took this photo and she hasn't, she died fairly recently. So I'm going to put all rights reserved on the copyright of this photo. There's also terms of use. which give you the rights and go into details around metadata and things like that. So we're going to accept and agree to the terms of use and our image will pop up here. So it's distinguished differently um, with this little tag saying your upload. Now I don't want my photo of my grandpa to sit there because my first two photos are gonna be about 19th century bowling greens. So to move it down, you literally just drag it 
and drop it. And you can see there's some sort of rectangles that you can move your space into. So for now, I'm just going to put the photo there. So as I mentioned, I wanted to start my story with some information about 19th century bowling greens. And the first bowling green, the first was actually put down in 1861. So I want to add a photo of that. So to do that, I pop it out to explore. I put Auckland Bowling Green. And I'm just going to add Grafton because that's where it was located. So it doesn't pull up bowling clubs from other suburbs in Auckland. And there's 19 images. So I want to add an image. So I'm going to filter by images. I can filter further so I can select a, a decade, but I think we'll just choose one of these. So we're gonna add this one to the story here. And if I come back to my story, It's sitting down here, so I'm just going to move it up. So it's literally a drag and drop to be able to move your stories. It's um, easier on a bigger screen. There we go. So now it's sitting here underneath my text. Now if I wanted to perhaps, I've got quite a few photos about different club rooms. So I might want to add some text here. Um, lawn club rooms. I can actually make this, I can use some of the editing to create, say, a heading if I'd like to, and add some more text below it. So there's a lot of kind of room for, um, you know, adding text and creating headaches, uh, heading, sorry, and moving things around and grouping things. Um, so you can, um, you can set this uh, access. So at the moment I'm hidden, which means that you can only view it with the URL. But if I wanted to make it public, I could select this and save the setting. So I would do that once it had finished. And I accept the terms and conditions. And now when I come to search for lawn bowls, It should pick up this one story. It might just take a little bit of time for that to turn up. But eventually, once it catches up, there will be a story available there, as well as the images and other content. So I thought we'd look at some other stories. Um, there are some really great stories here. There's one on selfies. They don't all have to be terribly serious and informative. And this one doesn't use any text. It's just images only. Um, they're a great way of telling New Zealand history, so telling the stories of the people and places and historical events in New Zealand history. And there's this great one about Crown Lynn. And so Nicola, who wrote this story, she, uh, when one of our, our new content partners, Te Tō Uku, the Crown Lynn and Clayworks Museum, um, became part of Digital NZ, she actually went and updated her story and added a whole lot of content from here. 
So you can see that the Te Toi Uku content sits alongside content from the Ministry of Culture and Heritage. And Alexander Turnbull Library. So they, you can kind of bring together lots of content. And you can also see that Nikki has uploaded her own photo. So she had a photo of this New Zealand Railways Cup photo and it's identified here by uploaded by Digital NZ user Nixit. That's her, her username. So yeah, the, um, the stories are a great function, a great tool for you to be able to sort of tell your own stories using Digital NZ content. Um, I can chat afterwards with any questions, but otherwise I will hand over to Tim. Thank you. Um, kia ora koutou, uh, and thank you so much, Kelly. Um, just thinking, there's a couple of questions there in the Q&A. Do you want to do them right at the end? Yep. Okay, cool, cool. Um, nice one. Um, yeah. <laughs> All good. Uh, kia ora koutou, uh, nisan bolivinaka, and whaka lafo atu uh, to each of you. Uh, happy New Way and Language Week. Uh, for those in Tamaki and around the country as well. And thank you to all of us, all of you who've joined us. 81 at last count. We've lost one since uh, Kelly handed over to me. So I'll just take that personally, um, but I will continue. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, as uh, Joan said in her introduction right at the start, um, <clears throat> I am the program manager of the Pacific Virtual Museum Pilot. Uh, that is a, some of you may be aware of that, uh, That is, but uh, for those that don't, that is a, or it is a two year, uh, grant funded project uh, by the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade in Australia uh, and implemented by the National Library of New Zealand uh, in collaboration with the National Library of Australia to explore and uh, try to make visible and accessible digitized cultural heritage uh, for people in the Pacific and for people of the Pacific. Uh, and when we say Pacific, we mean uh, broadly speaking, Polynesia, Micronesia, and Melanesia. Uh, and I don't have a slide deck like Kelly uh, uh, created, but I will share my screen uh, and I'll walk through a bit of a demo on what we are and how we work. So, and like Kelly, I will have to navigate through some windows, lots of chat boxes and other Q&A on my screen. So, um, just resize this and hopefully you can all see that well. Uh, this is uh, the Digital Pacific site, Digital uh, Pacific, P A S I F I K dot org. Uh, and that is the, the, the top person or the Papua New Guinean spelling of the word Pacific, uh, intentionally chosen to represent um, the, the wider range, I guess, of the Pacific, uh, not just Polynesia, where Aotearoa is, is based, but also Micronesia and Melanesia. Um, our site, exactly like uh, what Kelly described with DigitalNZ, uh, is not a repository, and we always point uh, our users of our site to the holders of the content, the source content. Uh, and I'm very excited to be able to do this because I'm going to scroll past the locations, and I know Claire Lanyon's here and probably a few others on our, uh, um, our co-design group. But as of this morning, uh, after a whole bunch of work from uh, my fantastic colleague Ulu Afiesi, um, we are now harvesting records, a very small slice of the records from the Digital Public Libraries of America API. Uh, they have a corpus of about 44 million records. Uh, we're pulling a very small segment of that, um, about 60,000. Um, but as you can see there, top line, we're now pulling about 59,000 records from the Smithsonian, uh, from a number of other places across the United States, National Archives and Records Administration, alongside Auckland Libraries, California Digital Library, um, Coconut TV, which some of you know, may know if you're in Tamaki, um, Paradisec, which is in Australia, and also Trove Digital Library. And so to, to um, Kelly's point, as she said there, that our, our aim of our project is like, like Digital NZ, to make it easy to search across multiple content partners and holders of records. Um, <clears throat> whilst Digital NZ scope is uh, predominantly uh, New Zealand-based institutions, our scope is global. Uh, we want to highlight the content of uh, holders in the Pacific, um, but we're also leaning into the fact that there are uh, hundreds of institutions around the globe that hold records and items and images and photos, um, <clears throat> and also audio and video of um, the Pacific. Uh, and so 
it's very exciting and it was only about half an hour before the session start that those records became available. So I just wanted to do a little plug for them uh, and and what it means for Pacific people in terms of using our site. Um, but as uh, we are focusing on how to create users, uh, create stories and share stories, I wanted to talk through our version of that. Um, because our site has been designed, um, you know, sitting right alongside our colleagues at Digital NZ, we've worked quite hard and I've had a number of conversations with Digital NZ team around how to create a similar function. One of the things that we've lent into is, um, I'm sorry, I'll just scroll down to uh, where the stories are, our user contributions, is um, we've lent into two things. One is that Pacific Island traditions are oral. Uh, and therefore, what is it to share some of those oral recollections, whether it's memories, uh, whether it's uh, knowledge, whether it's um, uh, just insight onto uh, an, an item or a record. But we've also lent into, for the site to work in the Pacific, uh, we've intentionally designed it to be very low in, in weight and in bandwidth. And so building a similar functionality as Digital NZ has done would actually make be really problematic for us as we uh, it would make it difficult to work on mobile devices and also on more low bandwidth environments. So we focused on uh, only basically people sharing essentially in a written format their oral memories and their oral stories. Um, and so the, the design of it is quite light uh, and I'll just like Kelly did and Kelly, I was blown away by how well you demoed that because that was fantastic. And I just hope I can match it in the same way. I'm going to use uh, a record um, from uh, Dr. T, uh, Talanoa with Dr. T, Teresi Vunadilo, who some of you may know. Uh, and we uh, harvest from her YouTube channel. And this is a um, uh, an interview she did with Dr. Katie LeBlanc, uh, focusing on um, pottery in the island of Kandavu, and actually from the province of Yahweh, which is where my um, father is from. Uh, and as you can see here, as we present it on the site, we pull through the metadata. In this case, all of the metadata is written in Bowen, uh, ba the Bowen dialect of Fiji, uh, and we present that there. And if you see down the bottom here, there's this little contribute your story function and button, but we'll come back to that. Because actually, if I select this link, um, and, and just like Digital NZ, we're not a repository uh, of any sort. We show thumbnails and metadata. Uh, and so that includes um, audio and video. We always direct you to the source site to watch it or view it. Uh, and so this is where Dr. Uh, T has um, done this interview uh, in, in about the middle of August. It's approximately about an hour and 15, but actually at this 30, about 34 minute, session and I was watching it on on um, on YouTube as well as she does even via Facebook live um, at this 34 minute mark that's my bumbu my bumbu ulumila uh, and I'd never seen this photo because obviously <laughs> Dr Katie has this in her collection from her spending her time uh, and it was pretty amazing to see that photo and listening to Dr Katie because I remember her quite differently. Uh, I was really struck by how Dr. Katie probably spent more time with my Bumbu <laughs> than I have because of her opportunity to work there in in, in Nalotu in Yahweh. And um, I, yeah, it was a fascinating conversation to watch um, and a real privilege. Um, I actually contacted Dr. T and, and sent, um, sent her a photo of my Bumbu and uh, my dad uh, and asked her to pass it on to Dr. Katie in, in Fiji, um, just directly. Uh, in She's in Nova Scotia, my apologies. Um, but I guess I wanted to use that as an example of how our Contribute Your Story function works, because that's a very personal uh, memory, but um, a way of acknowledging it. Um, and so if I click Contribute Your Story here, this is our function where we um, we get a, get a little bit of an overview on on how the site or how this function works, which is basically, as it says on the screen there, um, sharing your thoughts, memories, and personal experiences or knowledge helps to create a more interesting and powerful experience for users um, of the site. So I'm just going to walk through and add a little bit of my thoughts. Um, this is uh, the simple web form that we've got. Uh, when you come through here, you can choose to either have your name displayed or to wish to be remain anonymous and be shown on the site as a guest. And we wanted to bring that privacy right to the front as you're entering uh, the, the details. Um, you can read the contribution terms here. I won't link to them now, just in short to say we've made them very, uh, work quite hard with the lawyers to make them very simple. In short, basically, we are only asking permission 
for your uh, to share your words on our site. Um, we don't claim any authority over them. We don't claim any usage over them. We acknowledge that they're yours um, for perpetuity. Uh, and it's quite a different one from even the Creative Commons or a, um, a rights holders one. We're literally saying, you just grant us permission to share the words. We don't make any claim over them. So if you um, uh, are on the site, please have a look through the contribution terms uh, and conditions um, and to make, you know, I think the bit of work went into them, but they're quite a point of difference to how most websites work. Um, I'm going to happy to have my name publicly displayed. Um, we asked for your email and the email here is uh, unlike DigitalNZ, we don't ask, we don't have a login. There's no login or sign up process. The email is basically to allow us to contact you uh, in the case of two things. As it says there on the screen, if you allow uh, the team or the content partner to contact you, this is the channel by which you're saying um, to have a contact. The second piece of it is that if in the case your contribution is reported or if in the case of you have um, posted something that's offensive and breaks our terms and conditions then uh, this email would be the way in which we would contact you to um, engage in a conversation around that uh, other than that we don't do anything with the email and that's uh, um, laid out in our privacy terms and conditions the key thing here though as well is that um, this is never displayed on the front page, obviously, <laughs> um, but I'll put my work address in, that makes sense. Um, the actual other key aspect we've enabled you to do is to, to state that you don't wish to be contacted any further about this story. And I think for me, this was personally, this was really important, but because um, uh, in a, one of the things about um, Pacific people's uh, knowledge and stories is that if they are appropriated and then taken by the content partner, by the institution, then that knowledge and story is bound by the institution's rights and conditions. Uh, and, and as I said at the start, we in, on our site, which is where this story is being shared, uh, we are not claiming any ownership of it. And so we wanted to enable the person posting here to actually say, no, I don't want to be contacted by this institution, um, I'm only comfortable sharing it here. And so this option here, I don't wish to be contacted any further a story is literally the point in which we, um, if, if you've selected that, if an institution or a curator sees your content and loves it and wants to connect with you, we can actually say no, they don't wish to be contacted. And that for us is the end of the story. Uh, but I think it's a really powerful way of allowing Pacific people and indigenous people to continue to hold their stories. Uh, and, and to engage in the re proper relationships if they are to share their stories further. Uh, your place, um, the concept we lent into with this form is the concept of, I, I guess, Turanga Waiwai, but also to reflect that Pacific diaspora are all around the world. Uh, and so some of them uh, have been to their islands, some of them have not, some of them were born there, uh, some of them were born overseas. And as it says in the little pop-up, this could be the place that you are right now typing it, uh, for me, Wellington, uh, it could be the place where your story is set. As I said in the video there, that's uh, my, my father's village of Nalotu. Or it could be the place uh, that you're most empowered by or connected to. And, um, you know, in terms of va'a and that, that relational concept, I think there's, there's many different places that um, um, Pacific Island people uh, can choose to call their own and say their own. Um, and this, the placing here in terms of how it's presented is, is presented publicly on the website and we'll see it. Uh, and so depending on which story you're posting or which contribution you're making, it could be any number of places. Um, so for today, I'm just gonna put Wellington, Aotearoa. Um, and I think one of the other things as I'm going through in here is, as you can see, it's just a simple text form. If you write this in Nuwayan or Fijian or, or Chamorro, that is what it is. We're not doing any translation for the sake of translation. This is actually about the stories uh, of the people submitting them. Um, and I'll just say, as I go through this demo, I probably will take this story down because I'm kind of uh, working through it as a, as a demo model, uh, which we can do. Um,
Um, and I'm just going to leave it at that. If I click next, um, I now get a quick preview of, of how that post, if you will, uh, will appear on the, uh, the, the website. Um, and that's it. If I click post, and this may or may not alarm some people, um, the, I get a little bit of a, a, a wrap up. Uh, and if I return to the item and scroll down, that post is now there. And the point about it alarming some people is, as you can tell, there's no moderation at the point of submission, uh, unlike Digital NZ, where you've got the privacy settings. Um, we've lent into, uh, I suppose, in a way, a, a Facebook model in which we know many of our um, Pacific people work and operate, in which actually commenting on things happens all the time. Uh, we recognize that there may be opportunities for individuals to use this for you know, rude or inappropriate uh, aspects. That's what the report this contribution button does. If that's in another foreign language or a language that we don't understand, we're kind of relying on the crowd to tell us, you know, the aunties to tell us that actually that's not nice. <laughs> uh, and um, I think the other really important thing is we've designed it hopefully so that it's not a comments thread. It's it's a distinct story that is separate visually and um, in color palette from this version, this metadata of, of the content partner. And so if you want to come along and contribute another story, you can. Uh, I'm really grateful to David Reeves from Auckland Museum, who um, might be over a year ago now when we were chatting about this, was fascinated by, and his phrasing was actually, if you've created a site where multiple versions of reality can be held in a single place, that's a very powerful narrative. I think the, the, the way we mostly think of the glam sector of libraries, galleries, museums, and archives is that they are the holders of truth because of their, you know, their physical state, because of the mana imbued in them. But actually, we know they are holders of versions of realities. You know, the items held at Alexander Turnbull Library, and I've seen many of them from the Pacific, are often only labeled and labeled very well by the um, acquisitions and descriptions or to the best of their ability, are labeled because that's what's on the side of the box or on the back of the print. So there's the truth in there is only relative to what you've got in front of you. And if we can create a mechanism that, like I said, right at the start, allows um, Pacific people to see thousands of records that they didn't know exist and are in storage and in institutions all around the world. And if we've created with this uh, user contributions function, the ability for them to add some knowledge, but also for that knowledge never to be connected to the institution, but to allow us to have a, a website that holds uh, the mana of the institution and presents it and actually holds and uh, protects the mana and um, uh, you know the the integrity of and, and of, of of Pacific Island people in a way that they want to express it um, I think that's a very powerful powerful metaphor for how we can um, enrich the experience of viewing these records um, and to give you an example if I go to these user contributions um, and this is also by design, any new contribution is shared here. So what this allows us to do as the as myself and Tapa to, to actually see any any appropriate um, contributions, they're always all the contributions are always on this page. So we don't have to go searching through to 150,000 records. Um, we see them as they're posted. And I think what you now have as you look at this section of our site user contributions is now suddenly you have as hopefully this develops a different lens or a different way of approaching these records. Namely, the interface to these records is now not through the front doors of um, the National Library on Molesworth Street or the, the entrance to Te Papa. Or, and it's not through the catalogs that you have to search if you go to their websites. The, 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 the front door to this these records is now through the eyes or through the emotions or through the senses of the people who've posted stories of the Pacific. And I think that's a really, you know, there's only 18 contributions, but I think it's a really wonderful way of framing these records. Even, I love this one. <laughs> I'm not sure, you know, from Theo, add some collections of, of orchids and I'm going, yep, we'll keep looking. Um, I love this one from Ruka, um, you know, a lovely personal memory of this, you know, kindergarten by the sugar mill. I used to go to the kindergarten by the Lotoka sugar mill back in the 90s. And when the mill was in production, I remember a sweet smell coming from the mill. And that's it, you know. Um, some of these other ones are done in 
<coughs> Cook Island Māori in Fijian. Um, they speak to experiences, absolutely lived experiences that are invisible. I think what I loved about um, this one is this is a photo from the 1992 Six uh, Festival of the Arts in, Cook, in the Cook Islands, and this person has posted it. I was 12, and this was an awesome site. You know, they were sailed from all over the Pacific. It's the last time this was done, and I've forgotten how many canoes came. You know, and I think that might have been a conversation in a family or between a father and a son or uncles and cousins. Um, it's now here on our site and for anyone who comes to look at that. Um, and it's um, we've not had to go through any great um, process to get that done. It's just here. And I think, and I'll finish <clears throat> with this one because I think um, this this is also from the Cook Islands, this Moki holiday um, image because when I think of that version of truth and that default that our institutions are the holders of truth, this metadata here, this thumbnail here, this image here, is all that Te Papa holds. It is the only way of describing this, this image and this specific experience. Uh, you know, it's not even, it's sort of somewhere in 1992, maybe, you know. Um, if I scroll to this, that first sentence is amazing. <laughs> The mama in the pink is my auntie Tungani. And straight away, the narrative changes and that we've created a space where this person feels comfortable sharing that story. And it's not taken from them because Te Papa doesn't own it. It's not bound by any uh, licensing. Um, but it is a memory that <clears throat> they have been comfortable sharing. That is a really powerful thing. Um, and I think I'll stop there. <laughs> oh, I didn't realize that would happen. Um, I, I am immensely privileged to be able to lead this project. And I think um, if our function, our user contribution function, and I'm, I'm really uh, <clears throat> clear with saying that, that this is not a feature. Because you make a feature, it's a feature of this site. Um, we want to shine a light on the lived experiences of Pacific people, and we want to shine a light on the work that institutions do in holding and managing and and um, preserving these. Uh, and if we can be a small space that helps people see both sides of those worlds uh, differently and and in a more powerful way, uh, that is, we have done a good job. Um, so thank you um, for uh, listening to me and to Kelly, um, I will unshare my screen and I think we can go to questions now. Vinaka. Good to both of you for a wonderful presentation. Um, as some of you know, I've been here for a very long time and all the time I've learned something new and something well worth sharing. Thank you. We've got um, lots of questions, so I'll go to Q&A straight away. Um, I'll start with one for you, Kelly. Uh, so. The question is from Elwyn, um, do the uploaded photos sit on Digital New Zealand servers once they're uploaded? Normally, Digital New Zealand is a search hub rather than a content archive, is that right? Who actually holds the material uploaded from the public? So the owner of the, um, the uploaded content is identified in the copyright that you choose. So um, you don't actually identify the um so even if something is all rights reserved you still you don't necessarily need to name but that's the um the copyright owner but perhaps that's a field that we should look into um and yes normally digital nz does aggregate content um we don't hold it but the the uploaded content is moderated and held um by digital nz i hope that answers it <laughs> So one, uh, if you want to expand on that, do let us know. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and there's lots of lovely comments in chat and I'll make absolute sure that Tim and Kelly see those, but I'll move on to another question um, from Anonymous. Um, is there any sort of crowdsourcing possible on Digital New Zealand? I'm presuming this is around the metadata and captioning rather than the images upload function. Um, so in terms of um, the metadata that is um, that comes from the the institutions itself. So we're just aggregating that and bringing that into Digital NZ. Um, 
but the the way to sort of add your if you've got something that you know about that photo um, or that item you can comment on that and we check those comments every day and um, we we let the institutions know so if someone um, says oh that's my uncle and we can we contact the the institutions directly and then we let them know and then it's up to them to update their metadata so so yeah. is that commenting available for others to see kelly or is that just something that the yeah it sits, under, it sits underneath the item itself so everyone can view that um, and it uses facebook to sort of moderate that it's it's a, a facebook too tool so yeah so thank you um i'll run to one for uh, digital pacific um, actually, this is one for both of you, but I'll start with you, Tim. Um, can we share Digital Pacific um, material and stories on, or on um, an external screen, I guess that's, can we share this on a screen to build awareness and knowledge to those who are not of Pacific background? And the similar question, can stories in Digital New Zealand be shown on an external source, e.g. of presentations on TV screens and libraries? So perhaps you first, Tim? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the website's just the website, um, so it can be shown on, on any device or any big screen. Um, I think, you know, everything I've just demoed there is live and, and in, in public. There's nothing in the back end. Um, I, and I suppose, I'm not sure who the anonymous is, but if they wanted to contact me, I'm happy to present to any organisation or group um, around our project and what we're doing and, and how, it, how it could be of use to you. So happy to do that. Just before Kelly goes on, I'm just... Um... A lovely comment again from Elwyn saying, I'm constantly showing our AUT students Digital New Zealand. So uh, it's so useful. I'm excited to add Digital Pacific to my demos. So there you go. Kelly, do you want to add anything to that? Um, no, that's great. It's um, such a valuable resource and just such a great opportunity for other people to tell stories, not just people who are publishers or institutions. It's just, yeah, it's great. Right, I'm running back to the top now. I'm going to lose my way, aren't I? I need to dismiss some of these now that we've bounced them. Um, another question from Emma. Kelly, how does the copyright of individual photos affect the story overall? And also, is there a place to add the creator when uploading photos? Very good question. So you can add the creator in the description field. In terms of a compulsory field, no, that's not there right now. Um, but yeah, I'll make a note to sort of do some user investigation around that. Um, in terms of copyright, so a user uploaded image doesn't turn up in a search of Digital NZ, it just sits within the context of the story that it is added to. Um, so if you find an image, perhaps you took the photo and someone's, you know, copied it and uploaded it. Um, you need to to report that um, as a copyright infringement, and then we'll we'll manage that situation. Um, yes, but in terms of how they sit in the story, they're all treated the same, no matter what the copyright um, situation is. Thank you. Um, here's one that I think was actually for Kelly because it was put up about that time, but I think it's equally um, interesting for Tim. Do you run any special campaigns to build stories on specific topics? And I know um, Digital NZ does have stories on specific topics relating to, say, um, an anniversary or something, but do you actually ask people to create those? Uh, from time to time, we do. Um, we haven't for a little while. So, um, yeah, we're planning um, to look at stories in other languages. Um, yeah, what about you, Tim? Yeah, we haven't run any campaigns as yet. Again, our, our context is a little bit different. You're kind of le leveraging or not leveraging, you're opening the door for people to share their memories. Um, we have discussed, um, and I, I think as often in the way, at least in my Fijian family, <laughs> when you all get together, all the stories start to flow uh, in a one on one or an interview, or even just by yourself, maybe they don't flow as much. So we have discussed about doing, you know, sort of, uh, you know, small events where the community comes together and they've got devices to add stories and share photos and look at it. So you're actually 
bringing, uh, making it a relational space to share stories and then the output of those stories are then shared directly on. Um, it's a little bit more challenging, I suppose, in terms of um, you know, COVID conditions and not being able to get to places. Um, I think it's, uh, um, it, it's a challenge. I mean, we, we, because we're not designed like the digital NZ model, it's harder for us to theme, if that makes sense. You know, our story is a memory that's attached to a record or is presented next to a record. So um, the, the context for under, presenting stories would be from within a family or from within a church community or from within a, uh, a village. Um, and that, that, that we have to find uh, those spaces to host that to then do the, 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 the posting, if you will. And that, to say, uh, I was going to say, sorry. So what, what any of you could do <laughs> is if you were in one of those, then please use the site, get together, do that, have a cup of tea, share a meal, chat to each other and then share the stories. We'd love, we'd love to see that come through. Uh, a question from Eva Jean. Um, Kia ora Kelly, does Digital New Zealand use traditional knowledge labels, systems, or does it rely on the source institution to supply what's in the metadata? And I think you might have covered that, but perhaps specifically about um, Indigenous knowledge. Yes, yeah, so um, we do use the institution's um, metadata that comes through. Um, and we, I actually attended a really interesting presentation uh, with Tauranga, Tauranga Archives last week, um, where they looked at their traditional um, metadata and knowledge. So, yeah, we um, we do need to use what um, what institutions provide, but the way we do that, um, we're just exploring that a bit more. Thank you. We we, I can speak a bit to that. I don't know. It was more into Digital Z. So we, again, like like Kelly has just said, we always um, represent the the institutional uh, or the content holders metadata, and that includes copyright on our schema. That is our backend that would populate. Um, we have built the fields for traditional knowledge licenses and notices, uh, and we've had a number of conversations with local contacts, Jane uh, Jane Anderson and Maui Hudson. Uh, and uh, designed it so that if and when any institution is using that, then our, our API or our schema is sitting there ready to ingest that. We did have some early conversations around our functionality having a, applying a TK label, but because the TK labels are very much situated in a philosophically in a collective ownership or an iwi or a, or a, a tribal knowledge, our design is intentionally it's an individual contributing a, uh, an art, a memory or an artifact. And so um, in, con in, in conversation with Jane and, and Maui, we, we chose not to apply the TK labels at our front end, because ultimately where the traditional labels need to be applied are not in individuals' memories, but in, in the institutions that hold these records. Thanks very much, both of you. Um, lots of really interesting questions here. So I will go to one that's a bit more technical, or at least I, I think it is. Um, does the site have the ability to automatically identify links that have lost their source, i.e. link rot? I don't know who that one's for. Either of you? Um, <laughs> I can speak to it in terms of context of Digital Pacific, and I, and I suppose it's the, the supple JPEG end, so I assume it would apply mm -hmm. to Digital NZ. Um, basically, we our harvests are recurring, so uh, our scripts that we're running to um, bring metadata in from content partners are recurring. Uh, so, yep, if, if they die at their end, then if you click on it, then you will be it's you're landing on a dead page because at that at that end it's dead um <clears throat> we can uh we're currently not sort of manually looking for those dead ones because that it is a manual process for us um what the which is probably a half empty the half full way of thinking about it is every time any institutions upgrading or, or refreshing their metadata and hopefully removing their dead ones um we will harvest those and and harvest can recur at different times it just sort of depends on the scale uh, of the harvest, um, some on like on Digital Pacific, some of ours are running daily, some are running monthly, some are running weekly. Um, but essentially, we will always point to the most um, recent um, metadata that the institution's done. Kelly, do you want to add to that? Or um, yeah, so it's very similar for Digital NZ. Yeah. Thank you. Um, from anonymous, Tim. You said you're going to take it down later. I'm assuming that later, uh, if a person has mistakenly put something up and, and would like to correct it or take it down, can the person contact you to change it or alter it? Um, 
yeah. Yes, absolutely. We have, uh, I basically have admin access to the, the back end of the records. And so if a person contacts us, that can be updated. Um, we probably need to do a better job of promoting that. Um, <laughs> we haven't built it into the front end because um, it was very, um, you know, it's, it's, it's our first go at it, um, but we, we have the ability to edit it um, rather than people posting another one with the corrected version, if that makes sense. My lights have just gone out, but I think it's still all right. I think you can still see me. <laughs> one of the joys of being in a, in a room in the National Library. Um, let me just scroll down a little bit and see what else we've got here. Still quite a few questions. Um, Renee asks, do you have plans to allow users to add their own images within their contribution to a Digital Pacific record? This is something people often do on Facebook. Uh, yeah, it was considered with our co-design in our early designs, and it was actually not considered around images, it was actually considered around oral. Uh, and so that was instead of a person typing their story in, could they just press a record button and leave their, their we are oral tradition, so allow us the function to, to add an oral story. Um, and in the same way, allowing people to upload images. There's two things that come to play there. One, um, you know, the, the, the build time to do that and develop it well on a site, as I said at the start, is designed to work um, very well on, on or usefully on low bandwidth environments. Images and audio take up a lot of space uh, and become harder to serve over, a, over our low bandwidth networks. Um, the other issue that becomes there is uh, changing our terms and conditions again. So once we become a repository, we are across, again, as we are aiming at the Pacific, multiple jurisdictions and what is it to uh to acknowledge and create all all of the all of the legal frameworks in which you are holding people's uh records uh in a way that is housed within public sector public funding uh and also as i said it's across multiple jurisdictions it potentially opens us up to uh, more risk if people are challenging us um because it's not as simple as just having it on uh, you know, Amazon or, or a cloud service. And again, it's it's not, and I totally appreciate that it does happen on Facebook, uh, but Facebook is its own bubble contained uh, within all the terms and conditions you, you sign off on, which, which you scroll through and tick. Um, and so we, we don't have that capacity really uh, at this stage. We'd love to add the oral space and we'd love to add what it looks like for images, but the risks and the challenges of that within the digital constraints we work within um, are not insurmountable, but would be uh, would be a challenge. Yeah. Thanks, Tim. Um, we're running out of time, and we've still got a few more questions. So, so I will quickly ask a couple more, and then perhaps we'll have to answer the others um, in a different way. But from Facebook, is there an upload limit size size limit? So that one for for, for um, Kelly, I think. Uh, so the limit size limit for Digital NZ is 15 megabytes. Um, and in terms of uh, offensive images, so each item has a report this item button and you can click on that and report that and we'll get, we'll get um, notification about that image and take a look at it. Thank you. Um, Tim, I can see you're answering at least one question um, by typing an answer, but I think Do you want me to stop? <laughs> oh, is Joan still there? I can step in. I was actually going to answer Jay Brooker's question, which was, how do you see Digital Pacific being maintained long term? Um, and what financial provisions are there for support to continue? Uh, basically, we are in discussions for our next phase of funding. As I said at the start, this is a pilot, which is uh, due to finish in February, March of next year. Uh, we have completed our monitoring evaluation and on balance, it's a pretty positive um, uh, review uh, and we are looking to, uh, there's no guarantees in the way of things, but we are looking to um, put together uh, the next phase of funding. Uh, our hope and aspiration is that that phase of funding will enable us to set up something that speaks to sustainability and what that looks like in the Pacific environment uh, and in the GLAM sector is, is a challenge as well, but we are stepping into that. Um, I think I'd, I think we'd run through all of them. The last one here, 
uh, from Anonymous. Um, did you have any suggestions or advisories to support families in learning how to start digitizing their stories? Photos to share in relation to honoring the legacy of Pacific elders. Um, the community capacity building has been a huge one for us. It's been constantly referred to in our, in our construct. Um, unfortunately, because of our way we're funded, we're not able to do any digitization in this phase of the pilot. Um, there are uh, on Digital Pacific, sorry, Digital NZ and a few links on Digital Pacific around um, community aspects uh, for digitization. But yeah, we're really aware that it's a it's a, a huge opportunity. I would say challenge, but I like to be half full. It's a huge opportunity for um, not just individuals, communities and, and, and um, you know, different Pacific Island groups, but also the institutions. What is it to support community archiving, support community digitization to support ways in which these stories are recorded and um, preserved? And I know there's a number of groups doing that, um, you know, MCH and a few of the other things. Um, so just a chat, comment in the chat there from the review you've just done, how much of the work you're doing is contributing to bridging the digital gap in the Pacific space? Um, I think the digital, um, yeah, I think by design, we're, we're not that. Uh, we have we have built a thing that once content is digitized, uh, we can enable more visibility and access of digitized content. There is a huge challenge in digitization. Interestingly, though, from a number of the, so Solomon Islands National Museum, are a content partner in our site, they don't have a website. Uh, they uh, they lent into using YouTube, which again to archives and libraries is anathema, and I get that. But um, the this Solomon Islands National Museum looked at our site, looked at our project, wanted to be a part of it in a way that empowered them and enabled them in the way they could. And uh, they are using a YouTube channel with about eight to ten digitized videos, films of their collection. Um, <clears throat> I, again, I'll repeat, I totally get that that's not archival and that's not librarian quality, for lack of a better phrase, but it is what they were enabled to do. And I think my hope for this project is that if we're to lift Pacific Island institutions, um, part of that is allowing them to see the opportunities. Um, and it, 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 it's an ongoing challenge, but what is it to do it in a world in which, you know, with climate change, these islands will be underwater what is it to create shared spaces? What is it to enable them to tell their stories in their ways? Um, yeah, it's a, uh, I don't know if we're bridging the gap. I think we're hoping to see ways in which you could get across that gap and where the, where the places where more funding and more um, support needs to go. Um, yeah, I think we'll wrap up. Um, Kia ora, Veronica, thank you. Um, we will wrap up there. Uh, Joan has uh, dropped off on, offline uh, and I see a few people heading off to their lunch breaks as well. Um, thank you so much for joining us today uh, in the session. Um, we will, uh, as this is on Facebook and will be viewable there, <laughs> uh, it'll also be recorded and edited and put onto our respective Digital Pacific, Digital NZ and NatLib YouTube pages for you to reference. Um, as I said in the session, please reach out to myself if you're interested in any way about Digital Pacific. Um, and I'm throwing up to Kelly um, on my screen uh, if you want to reach out to her in terms of Digital NZ content. Sure, and um, I will I will pop the um, some links to some of our YouTube uh, webinars on how to make a story as well um, onto the chat too. Excellent. Thank you to everyone. Uh, enjoy the day wherever you are uh, and we'll look forward to seeing you next time.